Hello and welcome. I'm Ann Betteridge, Director of the Center for Middle Eastern Studies at the University of Arizona, and so pleased that you've decided to join us at today's presentation, Learning Ladino Online During Lockdown. Before we begin, I'd just like to remind you of some information about how the session will proceed. We're going to start with the talk, after which our speaker, Dr. Brian Kirshen, will respond to written questions from the audience. Uh, please enter your questions in the Q&A function you can find at the bottom of the screen. Uh, Megan Young of CMS will share the questions with our speaker. The chat function is reserved just for technical questions, which will be answered as we proceed by our associate director, Dr. Julie Ellison Spade. At the close of the session, a brief poll will appear on your screen. Thank you for answering it. Your responses will help us as we plan for future events. Earlier this year, three CMS staff members took an online short course in Ladino offered by Dr. Kirshen. Their enthusiastic response to the class, and I must admit our curiosity about his decision to teach the short course online piqued our interest. Dr. Kirshen, thank you so much for so kindly agreeing to share information about Ladino and the short course with us today. We have a lot to learn from you. I'm indebted to Julie Ellison Spade and Megan Young, of CMS for organizing this event, which is co-sponsored by the Arizona Center for Judaic Studies, the Center for Educational Resources in Culture, Language and Literacy, CIRCLE, and the Critical Languages Program at the University of Arizona. It's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker. Brian Kirshen is Assistant Professor of Spanish and Linguistics at Binghamton University in New York. He received his PhD in Hispanic Linguistics from the University of California at Los Angeles. In addition to master's degrees in Spanish literature, foreign language pedagogy, and Spanish linguistics, Dr. Kirshen has a BA in Spanish, Hebrew, and Arabic. His scholarly interests and research are in the areas of sociolinguistics, contact linguistics, and documentary linguistics, focusing on Spanish in the United States, as well as Judeo-Spanish or Ladino around the world. His many recent publications include articles on intergenerational transmission of Judeo-Spanish and language ideology and practice among Judeo-Spanish speaking Sephardim in Seattle and in South Florida. Dr. Dr. Kirshen serves as the director of the Israeli National Authority of Ladino's International Delegation of Shadarim. He's also taught beginning intermediate and heritage courses in Judeo-Spanish, as well as workshops in Rashi and Solitreo script. Welcome, Dr. Kirshen. I'll turn this over to you. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, let me share my screen in just a moment. Um, but first, uh, before I do that, uh, thank you to everybody for being here. I see a number of familiar names in the attendee list. So it's a great, uh, great to see many of you here with us. In particular, I want to uh, thank Julie Ellison Spate and Anne Betridge for inviting me to speak with you um, today, as well as the, the various centers that have helped sponsor this event. In addition to uh, Megan Young and several of the students at the University of Arizona who actually participated and have participated in some of uh, my Ladino classes this uh, this summer so it's a pleasure to be here today and thank you for that introduction as well um, you know within just a few weeks i'll be back to teaching courses at my home institution at binghamton university uh, about the spanish-speaking world and uh, that includes the linguistics of the phonetics and the phonology and the sociolinguistic uh, considerations that go into that and judeo-spanish is certainly part of the spanish-speaking world but a very unique aspect um, and one that is often unknown to many even within my field. So today uh, what I'll be speaking about is, um, I'll start with a brief introduction to Judeo-Spanish or Ladino, since I know that a number of participants uh, might not be even familiar with uh, this language that I'm speaking about and teaching. I'll get into, uh, I'll discuss one particular class that I offered um, recently online uh, the students or participants, the structure of the class, some feedback that I've received. Um, and then I'll speak a bit about teaching in general, um, teaching of Ladino in particular, and moving forward, which I think is something that is on all of our minds as teachers, students, and, and learners. So 
let me share my screen and uh, we will begin. Okay, so um, I'll begin the language, right? Um, this language, <laughs> Judeo-Spanish, as uh, many of us know, is a variety of Spanish. Um, to be more precise, an Ibero-Romance uh, language that developed in the centuries following the expulsion of the Jews um, from Sepharad, right? From the Iberian Peninsula, from Spain, um, and at the end of the 15th century. These Jews, Sephardic Jews, uh, found refuge primarily in cities uh, throughout the former Ottoman Empire, Turkey, the Balkans, but also throughout uh, North Africa and Morocco in particular, uh, where different varieties of Judeo-Spanish emerge, such as that of uh, the Judeo-Spanish of Morocco, Haketia. Um, Judeo-Spanish is a language that encompasses um, a lot of other languages, of course, uh, given the migration patterns of the Sephardim over the centuries. Um, Judeo-Spanish is primarily based on Castilian, even though a lot of Ibero-Romance languages were in contact with each other. But in Judeo-Spanish, you will find words from Turkish, and Hebrew, and Arabic, and serbo Croatian, French, Italian, etc., Greek. Um, this really has to do with the variety of religious, cultural, and educational opportunities that uh, were afforded to the Sephardim um, as they lived in countries outside of um, Spain and Portugal in, in the centuries following the expulsion. Um, so I mentioned that there are different varieties of this language. Judeo-Spanish was primarily written in Hebrew-based characters for centuries. So on the left side of the screen, uh, you will see um, an example of a Judeo-Spanish periodical. El Mesajero from Los Angeles, uh, a short-lived periodical uh, in Rashi characters and Miruba in, in some cases for titles and headers. But on the right side of the screen, you'll see a unique variety that is based on Hebrew characters known as Soledreo. Uh, and this is how Sephardim would write in Ladino. Um, more recently, we will find this language written in Latin characters. Uh, so as where one uh, particularly prior to the Holocaust, there were hundreds of periodicals, whether they were daily, weeklies, or monthlies in, in Judeo-Spanish. We'll now see um, Judeo-Spanish represented like this, and this is from the only remaining uh, periodical that uh, is published out of Istanbul, El Amanacer, and that is uh, part of the larger Shalom newspaper. Throughout my talk, I'll be using the terms Judeo-Spanish and Ladino synonymously, even though there are certainly linguistic nuances between this. Um, but that is more of a matter of nomenclature, which um, I can get to at a different point. Um, Judeo-Spanish, the reason that I used this term earlier, it shows the hybridity of this language. Uh, for many Sephardim, though, this language uh, growing up was just a form of Spanish, Spanyol, and for others, it was a type of Jewish talk, a, um, Judeo. Um, Judeo-Spanish is more of a, a current term, right, that we might use, especially in academia. <laughs> But it's also important to mention that Judeo-Spanish is not, um, well, it's very similar to Spanish. There are a number of differences that are important to keep in mind. And one is that Judeo-Spanish is considered an endangered language. And there are a number of ways to, um, to, to measure this. One of them is through the ethnologue's rubric of the expanded graded intergenerational disruption scale. And here you see languages going from international to extinct. And Judeo-Spanish, the unfortunate but the reality of it is that this language is uh, considered moribund or nearly extinct, where we see the only remaining active users of the language are members of the grandparent generation and older. Of course, there are exceptions, um, for better or for worse, but uh, this is the state of Judeo-Spanish. It, it is an endangered language for a number of reasons, um, primarily the genocide that was the Holocaust that wiped off the map um, more than 90% of Sephardim in certain cities, uh, particularly through the ba Balkans, but also due to forces of assimilation, linguistic assimilation and acculturation, where Sephardim um, learned the majority languages of the cities and states or countries where they resided over, uh, especially over the past century. Now, I mention all of this information because it really is important to, to know, uh, to contextualize this language. Um, I'll be speaking about my experience teaching 
Judeo-Spanish, Ladino. But this really shows what's at stake here. Um, as a language teacher, um, I recognize that there are different methodologies and pedagogies that we could use to when we teach. But teaching Ladino for me is not just another day of teaching. Um, it means a lot more. Um, and it's not just teaching Spanish. The people that I work with do not come to my Ladino classes to learn Spanish by any means. They are coming to learn something that is much more important and that has a lot of social significance and maybe even as part of a movement, which we could speak about. So in late March, um, I received a call from Ethan Marcus, who is the director of communications uh, of the Sephardic Jewish Brotherhood of America. The Brotherhood is a benevolent organization with 104 years of history, uniting Sephardic Jews, not only in the United States, but around the world. They have made it their mission in recent years in particular to unite and to engage younger generations of Sephardic Jews in America and reconnect them with their roots through social programming, such as their Sephardic Young Professionals Network, as well as religious digital platforms like their Zemiro.org project. I've had the pleasure of working with them in recent years and a number of other community partners to create our Ladino Day events in New York City, both in Queens and Manhattan. Ethan had reached out uh, at the end of March to see if I would be interested in offering an online mini series course in, in Ladino for the Brotherhood's new um, Sephardic Digital Academy, which brings together a variety of, of leaders and activists and educators um, to teach people and, and to foster community about language, culture, religion. And so I was happy to take part of this initiative. Now, again, I've taught different courses um, and Ladino in particular over the years, uh, over really the past decade from my time at Binghamton with courses or you know, different models of courses um, to even as a graduate student at UCLA um, through workshops or, or seminars. And I've worked with communities as well uh, at the Skirball Museum in Los Angeles, but this was going to be a different format. And this is um, a learning experience still, an online format that certainly um, has to be contextualized within, within the given moment. So after agreeing to, to put together this, this mini course, uh, soon enough from April to May, um, I would be teaching a, a five week series to learn the basics of Ladino. This course met once a week uh, for one hour on Monday nights. And it provided, you know, teaching online in general, provided a number of opportunities as well as challenges, especially during the time of a pandemic. Um, we did not know, um, the Brotherhood and I, of course, who would want to participate in a Ladino course, especially in the midst of everything going on and all the different options to learn. Um, the idea of Zoom burnout is real and spending so many hours in front of your screen uh, is challenging. So we did not know if people would want to be engaged in this way to learn Ladino. But in thinking back and reflecting, you know, this is maybe the small parts that we can do to, to help um, preserve this language. Um, of course, when I met with my students or participants, I told them that they're not here for a grade, they're really here for an escape. And whether that escape is to take an hour out of their day uh, each Monday night to learn Ladino, or maybe if they are Sephardic, to bring them back to the past when they were listening to this language from their uh, parents or grandparents, then that was really my mission. Um, I didn't speak much about the pandemic during our class on purpose. I wanted people to um, see Ladino used um, as a living language and, and focus on more positive experience, of course. Um, while I made sure to always wish them um, health and happiness and, and recognizing that these are not the easiest of times. So the Ladino language course for beginners then, um, the way that we pitched it was interested in learning how to echar la shon, converse in Ladino. This five week workshop will provide you with the linguistic building blocks needed to develop proficiency in Ladino. Sessions will focus on grammar and vocabulary and include an assortment of speaking, listening, reading and writing activities. Lessons will be catered to those who have limited to no proficiency in Ladino, as opposed to those who are already conversational. This workshop will be interactive and attendees will be asked to actively participate to make the most of their learning. So that's how we had uh, framed this uh, course. As far as the structure, the course was divided into 
five different modules, so to speak. There were five classes. The first class uh, was our introduction. It dealt with subject pronouns in Ladino. It dealt with introductions and how do we say where we're from and common sayings, of course. And this would really set the, the base for our um, subsequent classes. In the second class, we spoke about uh, always beginning with a review uh, of previous classes because some participants might have not been able to participate in all five courses. And so we always began with a review. Uh, the second class included the sounds of Ladino. I think that that's something that um, maybe we don't pay as much attention to, uh, but is extremely important. Uh, what are the sounds of Ladino? Why are they distinct and unique and in some ways show the historical development of Spanish in general? We spoke about that. We spoke about our likes, our dislikes. And as you can see on the screen, um, I wanted to present information in a way that wasn't just word lists. Um, you know, in some ways coming to Ladino class felt like putting on a show. Um, but I'm sure as many of my other Ladino, as any other teacher can really relate to, um, you know, when we get up in front of the classroom and now we're doing it in a different way virtually. When we teach, uh, we're putting our teacher hat on. Uh, we're engaging in a different way and uh, we are putting on a show in a way. Um, so the second class, again, likes and dislikes and different articles and definite and definite. Our third class, we began to really get into um, some of the content and grammar more um, from conjugating AR verbs. Where do you live? And you see that of país, right? In which city or country? Um, we spoke about differences in verbs, just like Castilian has said and estar, so there's Ladino. So we spoke about that, the conjugations, as well as numbers, at least from one to 20, using songs, of course, of course and music to, to help contextualize uh, this information, Sephardic Ladino music. In our third class, uh, we spoke about um, this, the fourth class, I tried to make it a little bit more culturally relevant. And I told, uh, as a sneak peek to students, that we would be speaking about Ladino in the 20s, which here we are <laughs> in the 20s again. Um, but this had to do with the 1920s. Um, you know, really at a time, especially in New York City, when Ladino was maybe at its height, right? In the 20s, um, with all of 20s and 30s, with uh, a lot of migration into um, New York City and the United States from Sephardim from uh, the Ottoman Empire. So uh, this class had to uh, deal with, this class dealt with um, Lower Manhattan and Orchard and Delancey Street or Broom Street. There's uh, still a very rich and uh, history and, and community um, there in Lower Manhattan with Sephardim. And this one class had to do with a, a play that I found Merequias de Orchard Street, that was the title. Merequias are your worries, or it was also translated as Orchard Street Blues, translated by, uh, or created by, David Fins Altabe in 1995, and performed at different points by his Ladino players, a theatrical group in New York City that performed different uh, plays that he put on. So this was a text that uh, I modified, of course, to that, uh, uh, of something that beginners could really engage with. Um, so I put up different um, examples on the screen, some images, of course, uh, but what you see on the screen is really a nice example of what Ladino is um, with words from different languages, of course. I had different participants um, unmute themselves and in an orderly way, um, we had a variety of students participate, as many as possible within the one hour uh, time frame, of course. So students were able to get a feel of maybe what it was like to have uh, um, Sephardic life in New York City. But also this play was particularly interesting because it also discussed um, conversations and contact even with Ashkenazim, who spoke Yiddish, of course, and what type of contact or jokes that might even emerge from. So this is Ladina, right, what you see on the screen. Um, and then our fifth class, which was our final class, we continued and we spoke about other verbs, the class was never, as you know, language teachers will know, um, the class is never just today I'm going to teach you ER and IR verbs. That is one of the goals, but how do we do this? And of course, for the fifth class, um, I had to bring in Jilha, which many of my students, of course, are familiar with in general, um, who is, I'm sorry about that, uh, who is a part of Sephardic folklore. Um, let me go back to this, okay. Um, and, you know, where does Jilha go um, and what does he do? So we were able to play it. Uh, in that way to teach colors, to teach about the animal, animals and places and whatnot. 
Um, so that was kind of a, a brief structure of the five weeks of classes that I offered. Um, now, as far as Zoom, uh, Zoom was our, the platform that we used, of course, which, as I mentioned before, also provided opportunities and challenges. Um, people are now familiar with Zoom, increasingly so. Uh, we were able to uh, engage with people in a way that we would not have been able to do had these been in-person classes. Um, the experience, and um, we were fortunate enough to have uh, the class advertised and written about in different ways, uh, in one case in a news um, outlet, and another case by Avia Kushner, who wrote, uh, why Zoom means boom for uh, boom time for Ladino in, in the forward. Avia was actually a participant in, in our class throughout the five weeks, who's a writer of the forward, but um, felt like this was something that she wanted to share with her readership. So Zoom really provided a great opportunity. And I'll speak a bit more about the students and um, um, where they're from and who participate in just a moment. But I was very fortunate, we were very fortunate to have this go very well. Uh, we did not experience any uh, what is now being called as Zoom bombing. Um, at a time when we were still experiencing how, how to register people for this class, um, you know, we did share the link with everybody through social media and whatnot. Um, it was not password protected, but uh, we did have um, a room beforehand, a waiting room for people to be admitted in beforehand. And we, we took certain measures, of course, for security reasons, but uh, it went very well. We did not have to deal with some of the realities that other people have had to deal with, unfortunately, when offering uh, public classes to the masses online. So as far as the students, who are my <laughs> wonderful students that participate this, in these classes? And I, I say students here, even though really, I mean, they're participants. So that's why I have students in quotation marks. Um, again, I mentioned that this was for beginner students, but as any language teacher will tell you, what does it mean to be a beginner student? We have these discussions. Um, this class was for beginners to the point that I actually did not advertise this class to many of my Ladino contacts in the beginning, because I figured this is not a Ladino class for heritage or intermediate or advanced speakers or speakers in general. Uh, this is for people the many people who have contacted us over the years and say, I live in this city, there's no Sephardic community, how can I learn? This was an opportunity. Um, but I realized shortly thereafter uh, that people were going to attend the class regardless, uh, which was really a blessing um, to have a variety of speakers and learners uh, in our class together. But of course, also a challenge, right? Uh, when we want to construct a beginner class, uh, I made sure that even though there were students of all, students, participants of all, uh, proficiency levels in Ladino, um, that I taught this as a beginner class because that's what it was. And the key word, pacencia, patience, on everyone's behalf, of course, was important because I, I think that everyone who participated, even the more proficient of speakers, realized, you know, this is a beginner class and this is something that uh, we could all learn. It's also important to keep in mind, and something that I reflected on quite a bit, is that, you know, our typical Ladino speaker today, you know, we might say, is in their 70s or 80s, right? Um, yes, of course, there are speakers in their 60s and 50s. And I do know some who are even younger, right, in their 30s. Uh, but that's not common. These speakers of Ladino, um, heritage speakers, if we want to call them that, um, they didn't take Ladino growing up. They heard Ladino. They lived Ladino, right? So this was an opportunity for many of them to attend their first Ladino class for a language they already spoke. So in that sense, it was great to, to see that and to have that participation. Um, so that was my beginner student. Now this particular class um, that I met with the Sephardic Brotherhood um, had over 500 elevos students of all backgrounds, of all walks of life, which was also really exciting. And as a teacher, um, I like to know my students, but this is, you know, this, this, these are lecture hall numbers, right? Um, you wouldn't necessarily think that Ladino could bring in uh, the amounts of people. Uh, this was certainly not our expectation. Um, a blessing in disguise, perhaps. I say 500 plus because throughout the five weeks, um, we had people register, sign up right before in advance, um, before they participated. And Zoom, one of the great things about Zoom is that you can get uh, registration participant logs who participated, uh, who showed up, how many minutes they participated during each session. So um, there were nearly 500 registrants who had actually participated at some point. At no point were there 500 people actually in the Zoom room with me at any point. Um, but by the second class, for example, there were 180 unique users. 
And in the fourth and fifth class, there were at least 250 unique users, uh, 500 throughout five weeks. But I say plus also because in many cases, uh, something that we really can't account for or, or, ha or, or quantify in this sense was there were many people behind each screen in many cases. And it was a wonderful thing to see a parent and a child, a grandparent and grandchildren as well, um, or sometimes in some cases, entire families. So these were the students. Um, there were a number of surveys that were administered at different points throughout the class. So this is not by any means uh, um, encompassing all 500. Um, there are selections of students. And one of the surveys that the Sephardic Brotherhood put together was the following question. Do you have Ladino speaking roots? And that was classified here um, as native speaker, legacy speaker, grandparents spoken, et cetera. Um, and you'll see that of the 120 people that participated in this particular question, 57% uh, or 69 people said, yes, that they have Ladino speaking roots in their family. And 43% or 51 of those 120 said that they did not. I think it's important to realize just because we're seeing who, who wants to study Ladino. Uh, and we could do this in a number of ways, right? Uh, as a sociolinguist, I'm curious in particular about all sorts of um, factors, right? Uh, in regards to who's interested in studying and who are the participants. But this is one unique metric to see uh, who the participants are. Um, one of the questions was, de ande sos? Where are you from? And you'll see, I mean, this is a map that I put together based on some of the results. I mean, it's very revealing where my participants were from. Now, of course, one thing is where are you from and where do you currently live? This question was, where are you, where are you from? Um, but you could see this, these are not just um, my fellow New Yorkers um, attending this class or even those um, um, from the East Coast or even the United States. I mean, people from around the world were interested in learning Ladino, which really shows the demand or the need for this type of class or these types of sessions in general. But if we follow up with that a bit more, um, another question was, if you have Sephardic roots, right, of that population who has Sephardic roots, where is your family from? From outside the United States in this case, right? And you'll see, again, these are not all the areas where Sephardim are from, of course, but from the participants, from my students, right? Um, this map is very revealing of where Ladino speakers uh, and communities once were, or in some cases still are. And if we zoom in just a bit more around the Mediterranean, right, we'll see, okay, this looks like a Sephardic type of map, right? And of course, we have some cases here in Morocco, right, uh, or even Gibraltar. Um, but if we look more around kind of what was the former Ottoman Empire, we could see, you know, with Turkey and the Balkans, Port cities, I mean, this beautifully illustrates where Sephardi were, and in some cases, certainly still are, and where Ladino was a thriving and living language. So these types of maps are important to recognize that we're not talking about Spain spoken in Latin America, typically. We're not talking about Spanish, I should say, uh, in the Iberian Peninsula either. We're talking about a language that thrived, and on the one hand, retained um, linguistic elements of old, Spanish in, or Iberian, uh, Ibero-Romance languages, but on the other hand, uh, included a variety of other languages. So other information that we collected um, was about their enjoyment of the series after the class, um, how much did you enjoy the series from one to 10? And so we'll see people, in, you know, people enjoyed coming, people enjoyed participating in this series. Um, another question was about the continuation of the series. How much would you like to see a continuation? That was the question. And you could see most people wanted more after five weeks. We know that five weeks can only accomplish so much. You're not going to learn a language in five weeks, but it can certainly serve um, as a springboard to um, gain interest and traction. So as far as feedback, I think now this is gonna be some of the uh, qualitative information that we obtained. I chose a selection that shows what participants thought or felt about participating in, in these classes or this particular class uh, to take this out of my words. Um, so two of the larger uh, quotations here were, I wish my parents would have helped me learn when I was young. They made me take Spanish, so I guess they thought Ladino would rub off, but it didn't. <laughs> I'm not sure how much time I have once we start opening the country again, but I am so grateful. My heart is so full of love. I mean, of course, um, I mean, this is quite common. In the case of Sephardim in particular, um, we know that whether it was in New York City or Seattle, um, Sephardim often took language classes, Spanish classes in junior high and high school. If we're talking about right, the, the, 
in the past century or so, right? Um, and there was a lot of confusion between te the Spanish teacher and the Ladino speaker trying to figure out and, and negotiate exactly what is being spoken. Uh, in some cases, in many cases, the Ladino speakers teaching their teachers about this variety that many did not know about and many still do not know about. Um, now, of course, of, of particular interest of this quotation was um, about how much time this person will have once we start opening up, right? Um, offering this class at this time did provide an opportunity to engage with people in a way that um, we might have not seen in, in, in previous times. Um, people are at home more, um, but again, with ample opportunities to learn whatever they want. Um, so this was really wonderful to see that this was um, how people feel. Uh, but also something to think about as far as what will we do moving forward, right? When people have less time or people don't have more time to spend in front of their screen. Um, a particularly telling um, comment from one of the participants was, I feel empowered, enlivened, and connected to my people's past and future. Brian is teaching something of deep human, cultural, religious importance and making it accessible. There are such big forces that have tried and are trying to erase this language and he's a stalwart to making sure that I, a grandchild of a speaker who stopped speaking and never taught his family, now know the basics of my ancestral language. I mean, what more can you want as a language teacher, as a teacher, <laughs> as anyone doing, you know, trying to do the best they can? Um, I mean, this, this quotation is just, I mean, it's amazing to see that this is how people felt, right? And it's not because it's my class, it's because of the numerous opportunities that, um, people that I work with and the Sephardic Brotherhood are providing people to, to connect and engage in a way that brings them to a time of memory um, that they wanna be transported to. A few other shorter quotations here. I'm thrilled to recover the traditions I loved as a child. And we'll see, this, this is a repetitive pattern among uh, participant feedback. Listening to Ladinos being spoken reminded me of my mother and father. I enjoyed having the chance to witness how alive the language is. Now this was really my goal. The rejuvenation and relevance is great. Um, I mentioned before Ladino is an endangered language. It's certainly endangered, but to be clear, it is not a dead language. It is an endangered language, but it is a living language. And it is a different language than the language was 100 years ago or 300 years ago. Languages develop. Um, there are many language purists, of course, who you know want to keep language frozen and the same. But the reality is that languages develop and that's normal and there's nothing to do about that. That's how language works and um, that's what we're finding here, right? So I don't teach Ladino and you probably saw from some of the slides that I sh showed before, I don't teach Ladino as an endangered language. I don't teach about, um, only about memories from the past. Um, of course, that's, that's certainly part of the, the story and the narrative. Um, but I try to provide opportunities where speakers students can learn and use the language today, right? Um, so it was particularly nice to see that people are, are, are witnessing this language being alive, right? Um, that's not something we always associate with an endangered language. Um, encouraging for other professors like myself to work on building an undergraduate course on Ladino language and culture. I was particularly surprised to see um, numerous teachers, high school teachers, college professors, in this series, uh, native Spanish, native speakers of Spanish participate who wanted to uh, provide for their own sort of professional development or just curiosity. Um, often the case as far as within the realm of teaching Spanish, um, Judeo Spanish Ladino is not typically included, um, hardly ever. So it was really nice to see the interest and in, in the, um, especially in this case, that people now can bring back little elements of what they learn and maybe not create an entire course but a module, a unit, a lesson. I mean, this is part of kind of our, our goal to, to teach others about this unique culture and language. Uh, it was a fun class because it brought in cultural aspects and people from, were from all over, just as we saw in the map. And then here, the only reason I wouldn't study again is because I'm at capacity and just wanted to get a sense of Ladino. Not because I didn't enjoy it or anything like that. Merci mucho, right? Thanks, many thanks. Um, again, this is the reality, right? Um, and it's important to keep in mind because of all of the options that people have in all of the classes. I mean, think about how many hours a day you spend in front of your screen. And I'm really grateful for the people who are even in front of their screen right now <laughs> to learn not just Ladino with me, but to learn about, you know, my experience teaching Ladino. Um, it's, it's, 
it's great to see that people are coming um, um, to learn Ladino in, in this way. After the class, um, I have continued working with students in Ladino. Um, but one of the comments that I received quite often was that as great as a class of 250 or more than 200 people are in one Zoom setting, um, it is of course challenging to have and build a personal relationship with people. Uh, Ethan and I, we try to moderate and, and to include as many people as possible during uh, the class that I taught. Um, but it's not possible, right? Um, and for me, it's important to get to know my students. Why are they here? Um, administer surveys, get to speak to them. So this is something I was able to afterwards and differentiate learning, uh, really provide scaffolded learning to different levels, my beginners, my intermediate, and I was even able to offer a course for heritage students as well. Um, different courses, uh, you know, many courses, of course, um, to get to work with people who really wanted to uh, see the progress. And I wanted to see people's progress as well. Um, now this all comes to um, the point that Ladino teaching, um, I'll situate this primarily in the US, is nothing new in particular. Um, at this very moment, you know, other than the courses that I'm, I'm providing, um, there are additional opportunities to learn Ladino, um, not just from, from April to May, but really all throughout the summer. Uh, Rachel Bortnick, Rachel Mada Bortnick um, from Dallas uh, did a part two or another beginner series um, that I just finished last week with the Sephardic Brotherhood of America, uh, which was also very successful. Um, Liliana Benveniste offered Ladino courses as well. Um, she's based in Argentina and Buenos Aires. Uh, we also have different courses that Sarah Aresti were offering, workshops uh, catering to younger children and especially through music, which is extremely important, especially if we want to focus on who our target audience might be to preserve the language. And of course, uh, David Muniz this summer, uh, Hebrew University of Jerusalem, is offering online courses through the uh, uh, University of Washington in Seattle for university credit. So I think it's also really important that it's not just one class, one instructor. Uh, we're providing people opportunities to take classes, um, whether they're once a week or intensive classes. And that's something that's really important to have a series of voices and opportunities. If you need university credits, great. If you only have an hour and a half once a week, there's something for you. Right? And in many cases, they are participants, students who are taking advantage as much as they can and participating in all of the classes. Mashallah, right? That's wonderful. Um, as far as teaching of Ladino at universities, uh, this has been something within the past couple of years, what you see on the screen. Um, it's important here that I mention uh, two things. One, we have, um, I like to consider them really as pioneers in, in um, Judeo-Spanish education in the United States, right? We could talk about the massive initiatives in Israel um, and other places in Turkey, of course, to teach Judeo-Spanish. Um, but within the context of the United States, um, Gloria Asher of, of Tufts University um, has taught Ladino for decades. Um, Daisy Braverman of, of UPenn um, also uh, has taught Ladino. Native speakers of Ladino from Izmir, right? Um, have been working effortlessly, tirelessly for, for years to teach Ladino. So, um, you know, this comes in, a, uh, this is a continuation of really the work that they have done and continue to do uh, at Tufts and, and UPenn. And of course, we have other universities um, that offer uh, not just Ladino language classes at times or workshops. In the case of UCLA, there's a UC Ladino student organization with workshops and annual symposia, but also all of the work done by Sarah Abrataya Stein with the Sephardic Studies Initiative and all the work through the Marie Samato Foundation and program. And of course, everything going on at the University of Washington with the Sephardic Studies program with Devin Nahr and, and his um, colleagues as well. Um, at Binghamton University, I have the privilege of working with uh, our students, uh, many of them who are Jewish, many of them Sephardic, many of them who are Latino and who are particularly interested in Latino. Um, and as of this fall, I will be uh, launching what we're calling the Ladino Lab or the Ladino Collaboratory with Professor Dina Nannan, uh, of historian of Sephardic history uh, at Binghamton University as well. So there are numerous opportunities and many of them are going online, if not all of them at this point. Um, what we're going to see is that speakers and learners are going to have to go online to, to learn and to continue to engage. Uh, but before this, there are also communities that work together and uh, teach, you know, take the language in their own hands, which is really important. Uh, Ladino is definitely 
doing well, I would say, at universities. We could always do better and have more offerings, which is why it's exciting to be invited to um, speak at uh, different universities in settings like this. And I'm appreciative, uh, grateful to the University of Arizona for this chance. Uh, but we have Los Ladineros in Seattle who get together weekly, at least pre-pandemic, of course. Uh, some are shifting to online, of course, uh, meetings. The Sephardic Federation um, of Palm Beach County, I've had the opportunity to attend both of their classes for several weeks. Uh, offers Viva, uh, Viva Ladino and Achar Lashon, Lashon sessions in Boynton Beach, Florida. Uh, these are community members and speakers teaching themselves and reclaiming their own language, which is also really important. Um, and of course, I have to mention that uh, this all, you know, teaching Ladino is not um, online. You know, while we're seeing a spike in interest and we're seeing massive numbers in regard to Ladino, um, in my opinion, uh, this really comes from um, this is really building upon the energy and the movement and motion that many people have put together. You know, we have Ladino on social media. We have Ladino groups on Facebook and, and, and lots of, uh, um, lots going on on Twitter and different social media platforms. But Ladino Comunita, which was an online, which is an online forum, uh, a listserv of sorts to connect speakers and learners from around the world. Uh, the lead moderator and uh, founder of this group, Rachel Model Bortnik, who is uh, also on the call with us now, um, you know, is also a pioneer, and she uh, launched um, Ladino Comunita, a virtual community, really, something that built a virtual community from speakers and learners from all around the world uh, for the past 20 years, right? And this is an online group. So the innovation to bring Ladino online and the, what online and technological advances can do, not just for Ladino, but in danger languages, this is something that we've been seeing with communities um, for a number of years already. So this is something that uh, you know, I wanted to mention, of course, because it builds upon a, a larger tradition. Um, so moving forward, um, and here I'll stop sharing my screen for just a moment. Um, great, so as far as moving forward, I mean, this is um, a very important uh, question and, and consideration that I don't think uh, not just one person has the answer to, of course, but people are at home, and the internet and platforms in particular like Zoom are providing us with ways to connect, uh, keep community, but also more importantly, I think build community. Um, even with the classes that I see, that I've taught or participated in, it's amazing to see how vibrant the um, chat settings are, the, the chat rooms are, right? The chat feature and to see participants really helping each other as well. You know, as a teacher or as the person that is going to be leading a discussion or a class, um, it's challenging to read all of the uh, comments in the chat at the same time. Uh, when I was teaching the class with the Brotherhood and there were hundreds of people, you know, I did make an effort to scroll through every screen to see every person's face. Um, and I was actually surprised to see how many, I would say much, more than the majority, uh, turn their videos on. You know, I had encouraged active participation. Um, and if they could turn their videos on, it was something that people did do. They weren't just... Uh, names behind the blank screen. Um, it was a nice way to engage with them, but it was also all of the subsequent conversations that were happening in the chat as I was teaching. Um, the class was not to teach people what the origins of every word was, were. Um, that could be an entirely different class, but people had additional questions about language, origins, etymologies, right? Uh, culture. Um, so people were connecting and building community in some ways. Um, through this chat feature, uh, creating additional groups outside of this one hour, or in some cases, hour and a half uh, lessons, uh, which I think is something that's really important as far as what can be done. Um, well, for many, taking an online class might have seemed like a challenge or even produce reluctance. I think we've all learned, uh, or many of us have learned, of course, to embrace new forms of learning, teaching, and connecting. Um, Something that I try to remind myself also is that especially during a time like this, when we are, um, you know, in the, in the midst of a pandemic, right? Um, I don't think we need to expect people to be at their best and offer the best online class or the, have the best participation from students. But what I'm seeing is that people are engaged, people want content, people are embracing content and what I'm seeing also is that for those people who are able to offer something um, are doing their best really to provide content, to generate interest and to pe keep people coming back as well. 
Um, people have been very patient, respectful, I've noticed, um, and interested, which I think is also the most important. Um, so of course, while we don't know what the future holds uh, as society begins or continues to open up, as we saw in some of the comments before, I think that this moment in particular has taught us something in regard to language, especially in, in the case of Ladino, where we might think that uh, language could become more fossilized or language might not be able to be used as we're just home and we don't have opportunities to speak. In the case of Ladino, there are so many people who want to learn the language who are not connected to a community. And for years, people have been asking for an online class. Um, and this is something that really said, you know what, let's do it. Let's bring it, let's put together online classes. Um, but it's also shown us the importance of, of doing this at this time. So in the case of Ladino, uh, where speakers also are scattered around the world, this is just another way to bring them together. Uh, something that builds off the tradition of maybe more static or textual uh, fora that were created for uh, either listservs or online you know, social media. Uh, this is something where we could see each other face to face and use language as language is often used uh, as a spoken vernacular. Um, so speakers and, and cities and communities are coming together, building bridges and offering online classes, of course, is going to be essential moving forward as well. But I think in general that this is not, as I reflect on this, this is not about reinventing the wheel. I'm not trying to do that, um, but it's just trying to make that wheel work in the 21st century, right? We are using technologies that have already existed. Um, Zoom has become extremely popular. It's wonderful, but of course we know that there are problems also associated with technology at any moment. Uh, we could have a technological glitch. Our class could end. We could come back together. These are things that we have to keep in mind and that you know, we speak to our students and, and, and about as well. So we're going to have to do that more, embrace with um, new technologies and, and ways that speakers and learners want to engage. But as one example, this past weekend, um, I met, I had a meeting, of course, via Zoom, with a number of educators and stakeholders uh, of Ladino, and we were already beginning conversations about what to do, how do we uh, continue this um, excitement and provide new content and generate future interest in the language. Ladino needs to be spoken, it needs to be taught, but aside from these classes where we're teaching language, we also need to start thinking about, at least on our side, how do we create opportunities for people to actually use the language? You know, we have an hour, an hour and a half uh, of class and we have to get our agenda done. We have to teach, you know, certain elements, linguistic or cultural, uh, but we also have to start thinking about what we could do for people to use this language afterwards, especially people who uh, are, well, both, who are Sephardic and who are not Sephardic. Uh, so producing content that is of interest to our speakers and our learners is going to be pivotal. Um, I work also with a group, um, as uh, mentioned earlier, the Shadarim, which is an international group of educators, activists, art artists, and stakeholders, essentially, in their local communities. And that's, you know, we speak to each other regularly about uh, what is going on in our communities, not just to learn about what other people are doing, but also to learn how do we maybe model um, certain programs, learn from the past to figure out what has worked and what has not worked as well to um, move into the future as far as Ladino goes. So I'll show this quotation, which I showed as I wrap up. Uh, this is a quotation that I shared at one point during my class, which comes from the masthead, uh, a, a very common um, saying in Ladino, cuando mucho escurece es para amanecer. It can be translated in a number of ways, uh, but things are always darkest just before dawn, dawn. And something that I also saw was, you know, when people, for the five week program in particular that I did with the Sephardic Brotherhood, you know, I received messages that people were waiting for Monday night. Um, People were saying that I was, they were looking forward to Monday night to come, right? And I'm sure this could be said also about all the other opportunities that people are, are um, having to learn Ladino as well. So uh, although we are facing challenging and horrible times with everything going on, um, there's something that is coming about that is beautiful in regards to Ladino, which is a hard concept to kind of grasp, I recognize. But seeing the energy and the emotion, I think, is, um, is something that's positive and something that is necessary, especially in the context of an endangered languages. Uh, so, merci mucho. 
thank you to everybody for uh, joining me for this talk. And I look forward to speaking with some of you about uh, questions that you might have.